Hi and welcome to this video looking at bonding and intermolecular forces. So first of all we're going to have a look at bonding in the periodic table. We're going to have a look at the bonding within different elements. So the elements on the left hand side of the periodic table, which I'm highlighting in yellow, all bond via metallic bonding. If we move further over, and we have a look at this small part of the periodic table here. These elements bond through covalent networks, so large lattices of covalently bonded atoms. If we move further over towards the right, we have the elements that you have known for years that bond through diatomic molecules. However, we also have to pay special attention to phosphorus, which bonds as P4, and sulfur which bonds as S8 molecules. So all of the blue highlighted elements bond through small covalently bonded molecules. The final part of the periodic table is the noble gases. They don't bond so they exist as monatomic atoms. So we have this progression from the left hand side of the periodic table where we have this large scale metallic bonding going across to covalent network bonding, then covalent molecules, and then finally no bonding at all with just monatomic atoms. If we look at covalent radius, which is half the distance between two of the same atoms bonded with a single bond. So obviously for some of the atoms this can't apply because they don't really have covalent bonds, but we do some little experiments and changes to be able to work this out. And we find that the covalent radius goes up as you go down a group and it also goes down as you go across the period. So we have it going up as you go down a group and it goes down as you go across the period. Now the reason that it goes up as you go down the group is because as you go from lithium to cesium you fill another shell with each row of the periodic table so this means that your atoms are physically getting bigger. If you go from lithium to fluorine, however, you're still filling the same shell of the atom, but at the same time you're adding one more proton. So you're increasing the nuclear charge as you go across the periodic table, which pulls in those electrons as you move from left to right. You are increasing the number of protons as you go down a group as well, but they're then shielded from those protons due to the full shells in between. The first ionisation energy is the energy that is required to remove one mole of electrons from one mole of atoms in the gaseous state. It's represented by this equation here. So Xg to give you X plus plus an electron. The ionisation energy decreases as you go down the group and increases as you go across the period. The reason that the first ionisation energy decreases as you go down the group is because of the shielding effect. So the outer electrons are not held as tightly uh, by those protons that have been added because of the number of shells in between. The first ionisation energy increases as you go across the period because of the increasing nuclear charge as you go from left to right across the periodic table, which pulls those outer electrons in more strongly. If you were to look at the second ionisation energy, that would be the energy required to remove an electron from something which has already had an electron removed from it. So it would be X plus to give you X2 plus plus an electron. For electronegativity, this is the attraction of an element for a bonding pair of electrons. So group 8 do not have electronegativity because they don't form bonds. We find some trends with electronegativity and that it goes down as you go down the group due to shielding of the outer electrons and it goes up as you go across the period. So cesium has the lowest electronegativity, fluorine has the highest. It increases as you go across the period due to the increasing nuclear charge which is not, not shielded by the electrons as you go from left to right have a look now at intermolecular forces. So intermolecular forces can also be called van der Waals forces and they come under three types. London dispersion forces, permanent dipole, permanent dipole attractions and hydrogen bonding. 
All of these three types of intermolecular forces are attractions between positive and negatives that can happen within atoms or molecules. If we look first at the weakest form of van der Waals force, which is the London dispersion forces. London dispersion forces help us to explain some of the properties of the noble gases. So if we have a look at neon, which has eight, which has 10 electrons, and if we represent those electrons as a yellow cloud around the neon, that yellow cloud of electrons isn't static, it can move around. So if that yellow cloud of electrons moves so that it is now more on one side of the atom than on the other, that would make this side of the atom slightly negative and this side of the atom slightly positive as all the electrons have moved over here. If there was a neighbouring neon atom, this would be affected by this, what we call a dipole, and it's a temporary dipole because it can move, and it would have an induced temporary dipole, where this neon atom has forced the electron cloud on the neighbouring neon atom to move. So you would also get a delta negative and a delta positive. This is a temporary situation, and these electrons can move to another point across the atom so they could move so that they were closer to the bottom of the atom or they could move so they were closer to the top of the atom. London dispersion forces don't just happen with the noble gases, they happen with all covalently bonded molecules as well and it is purely just a movement of the clouds of electrons causing a dipole and then inducing a dipole in the next door either atom or molecule. You then get an attraction between positive and negative, which can hold them slightly closer together. If we look at the next type of van der Waals force, which is a permanent dipole, permanent dipole attraction. These are stronger than London dispersion forces and only happen between polar molecules. So if we look at a polar molecule such as HCl, HCl has an electronegativity difference between the H and the Cl, which means that the hydrogen is slightly positive and the chlorine is slightly negative. This is because the electrons in the bond sit slightly closer towards the chlorine than they do towards the hydrogen. This is permanent and doesn't change. So whilst you still have London dispersion forces taking place, this is a stronger interaction, so takes precedent. If we have the next hydrogen chloride, it's also delta positive and delta negative, and you get an attraction between the negative and the positive ends of the molecules. We only get permanent dipole, permanent dipole attractions happening between polar molecules. An example of a molecule which has polar bonds, but is not polar itself, would be carbon tetrachloride. So carbon tetrachloride has polar bonds between the C and the Cl, the CLs are all delta negative as they pull the electrons and the bonds closer towards them and the carbon is delta positive. However, because of the symmetrical shape of carbon tetrachloride, it is not a polar molecule and therefore does not have permanent dipole, permanent dipole interactions. The final type of van der Waals force is hydrogen bonding. Although the name says hydrogen bonding, this is not a true bond, it's still just an attraction between molecules. This happens when you have a hydrogen atom attached to an oxygen, a nitrogen, or a fluorine atom. Hydrogen bonding accounts for some of the anomalous properties of water. So if we have a look at a water molecule. A water molecule has oxygen bonded to two hydrogens. We have delta negative on the oxygen and delta positive on the two hydrogens. And this is purely a permanent dipole, permanent dipole interaction. It just happens to have a special name because it has such a, a strong electronegativity difference. So we have a large difference in electronegativity between hydrogen and oxygen, which leads to stronger interactions between molecules. These stronger interactions between the molecules lead to the higher melting and boiling points of oxygen hydride compared to sulfur hydride and other hydrides within the group, and the same applies for nitrogen and for fluorine. 
I hope that you found this short video on intermolecular forces helpful. Please remember to subscribe or follow me on Twitter at Miss Adams Chem for updates on new videos. Thank you for watching.